Welcome listeners and viewers. We are back with another episode of this podcast after a very long break. I have a very special guest with me here. I have my fellow academic, Mr. Joshua Beneventi. Uh, Joshua here is a uh, fellow scholar, a fellow student of knowledge with an academic background in cultural anthropology, Arabic language, philosophy, and theology. So naturally, he checked all the boxes for me to have this conversation. His main areas of interest, as we will delve into later on, is how Platonism or Neoplatonism can be used as a uh, as a platform that can help us uh, look at the shared values that religious values such as Islamic or Christianity values uh, holds and how Neoplatonism can help facilitate that harmony. We will discuss that in great detail, but uh, for now, uh, Joshua is working as a life coach, as a filmmaker, and as an amazing content creator creating videos and uh, uh, content on philosophy. And I will share his content in the description below. So without any further ado, let me welcome, welcome George Paul. Thank you so much for coming uh, abroad on my podcast. Yeah, and thank you so much for having me. It's wonderful to be here with you. All right, let's begin. Uh, one of, I would like to start off by saying that I came across your content and uh, one of the most fascinating things that strike me that I, that, that became the reason that I really wanted you to come abroad and let's have a discussion was the fact that I noticed that you draw inspiration from all sources. You're open to both Eastern and Western philosophies and religious concepts. So I really applaud and appreciate that. And I feel like that could be uh, the, the the sources for uh, what we can call intellectual harmony. So uh, I, first of all, that's, that's the point I wanted to address. And uh, secondly, uh, I think if uh, let's have a formal conversation about your understanding of what is knowledge? What do you think uh, is knowledge, this whole pursuit? What is it actually about? Well, that's a very deep question to start off with right in the beginning, especially, um, yeah, I think from like a platonic perspective, right? Um, well, you know, there's propositional forms of knowing and then there's, there's like direct knowledge. And um, in the Greek, it, we'd probably distinguish this in terms of dia noia versus gnosis and so when we're talking about knowledge in terms of the way the world works right well i think there's probably three levels there there's opinions about how things are and then there is actual knowledge of of what seems to be like the mechanical nature of of the manifest world right how we exist how we move how nature functions etc cetera, etc cetera. and then we might say that there is a metaphysical knowledge right and this would relate to things like, for example, you know, platonic forms or these transcendental ideas such as the good, the beauty, the, the beautiful, the true, and justice, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And ultimately the one, right? Um, and this would bring us to to a conversation around religion, right? This would be in terms of theology. Um, and so, you know, like what Plato would say, and he talks a lot about this, I think, in the in the Phaedrus and like the Cratylus is he says that, um, you know, we use language very haphazardly and people use these big words like love and truth and freedom and justice, and they really have no idea what they're talking about. Uh, it's really predicated upon opinion or convention. So what the philosopher is trying to do within him or herself, and then also in due turn in society, uh, is to help people to you know, educate themselves, meaning to move from darkness to light, to come out of the cave, so that we can all go back down into the cave and 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 help other people see the light. And I think that seeing the light it comes down to this wow. ability to um, look inward, in as much as we look outward for knowledge. And so, um, you know, there are other ways of knowing as well that many of the the great philosophers and mystics of our various wisdom traditions have have highlighted. Um, so I think, um, you know, what is knowledge, um, uh, is, is a contentious question and can be answered in many, in many ways, like I just sort of outlined. Um, and I guess that my, my emphasis or my interest is in, in terms of justice, in terms of, uh, in the Islamic vocabulary, we'd say mizan, right? Balance the scales. How can we, Embod be embodied and live in in the modern world in a way that is taking into account both the internal and external forms of knowledge 
and how that can inform how we live our lives. That, that is a fabulously interesting uh, and profound outline that you just mentioned. And I think it is important to begin here is because if we want to talk about philosophy, the very definition of philosophy is love for knowledge, not for wisdom. So if, if, we, if we're talking about philosophy or we're talking about theology, these are all different forms of knowledge, which is why I think it is essential that we define knowledge first. And you've given a really interesting uh, 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 outline, but most of it is from what you would call a Platonic or Neoplatonic perspective. I had a follow-up question on that, just so that we're clear on the definition of, of, of knowledge, and we'll later delve into the definition of philosophy. Would you agree with the more modern or postmodernistic philosophical definitions of knowledge, which uh, in you know, a sort of state that uh, there, there is a subjective nature of knowledge, and there is no you know, theory of forms, there is no reality out there, and there's no subjective core that we are, you know, pursuing, but reality in itself is, is objective, it's, sorry, subjective. What do you have to say about that? What is your view on that? Yeah, so in terms of the postmodern relationship to the definition of knowledge, I think that, you know, we see that it, there are certain pathological symptoms that start showing up in culture when we, we relate to our yeah. definition of, of our existence, of our experience of life, of our experience of mind in this way. And um, you know, the fact of the matter is that when we study history and we zoom out a little bit from this very brief chunk in in our in the course of our history of the past couple hundred years, really, we see that um there clearly are certain fundamental principles uh, about you know, simply our biological existence on this planet that are undeniable, and that there are certain fundamental things that that are necessary for our survival as a species, and not just our survival but our well-being. And we see that when those things are eroded, such as uh, a meta narrative like religion, you know, when we see that that is severed uh, within the society at its at its root almost um, it really has deleterious effects upon the population in general and, and I know that we see this in the United States to a great extent um, you know there's this whole thing that people like John Verbeke would call the meaning crisis um, and you see certain voices rising up in the Western milieu um, who are championing you know the 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 response to this meaning crisis and and the more pathological sides of postmodernism. Um, so maybe we don't need to revert, you know, or try and or and try and instantiate a purely kind of platonic pre-modern uh, vision of how how the world is or how we define knowledge. But at the same time, I think that we need to again find balance and understand that there are certainly things that run true. Uh, throughout the the vast panoply of what human experience is. And so how can we take those things into consideration? You know, things I mean, as simple as like the nuclear family, you know, and seasonality and celebrations at certain times of the year, and which we can attribute in large part to religion. You know, what is religion other than sort of the the core of, of human culture? So... Like, so this, that's what uh, like this Islamic vocabulary would say, the elements of fitra, you know. The, yes. So, yes, yeah. fitra, exactly. And this is the, and I, I think to varying degrees, you have that principle within all of the world's wisdom traditions, but but definitely within the Islamic tradition, I think that this is um, something that that it really um, champions, you know, it, that is at the forefront of of what kind of characterizes the Islamic tradition is this emphasis upon fitra. You know, um, Abdul Hakim Murad, Timothy Winters, um, great scholar in the UK, he he talks about, you know, that out of the great world religions, you know, Islam is probably the most um, likely to bring us into alignment with what our physiological, psychophysiological uh, system was designed for over the long course of its history because we there's an alignment with the solar and the lunar movements in the cosmos 
there is this connection to the earth on a daily basis, um, to the elements, to the water, just in the form of it itself. You know, it, it gets us back to to this, you know, fitra of the natural world. So, so yeah, there are many beautiful things about that. I'm glad you brought up fitra. Yeah, because, uh, you know, I recently came across this concept about how we are one of the only species that, you know, actively or proactively interfere the course of nature from everything regarding our diets, regarding the places we live in, the food we eat. We very artificially, you know, alternate those things. You look at animals, they eat what's there. But we have the ability to produce our own food and lab in any way possible. And if recent history is a testament, that has not been a good thing. So that's just, you know, just to reiterate that point that uh, the, the elements of fitra are, you know, core. These are hardwired things and it, it's usually not good to, you know, divert away from that. But then again, mm. is there any merit to the postmodernistic idea? Maybe there is a core, but then there are some elements of knowledge or truth that still remain subjective or that will, for example, evolve and change over time. Oh, yes. Well, well, I want to say one thing before I answer that question, which just came to mind is um, there is a book that came out recently by another um, English Muslim revert uh, by the name of Ahmed Paul Keeler. And I believe the title is Islam in the West. And he has this whole theory called the Mizan theory. <laughs> and I think that one thing that we, again, I, I'm not, I'm not passing any value judgment on it personally, but we are definitely under the influence of this sort of Promethean um, manifest destiny uh, mythology at the core of our of our modern Western, I would say, in particular, but you know now sort of globalized culture, and that is that we're heading towards something, or there's there's a goal that we need to achieve, and technology is going to get us there, and. Um, this is very Promethean, and I think it has its roots probably in certain, you know, Zoroastrian, for example. Zoroastrianism is, is more of a linear view of, as far as I understand it, of, of time. We also see this in Christianity and Islam, but I think that it's a little... I mean, in my experience of Christianity is very much so that, especially within the, the non-denominational or Protestant world, it's very much, you know, the, the imminent coming of Christ. And so we need to be prepared for the end soon, right? It's a, it's a little nihilistic. I don't know if it's quite so intense in the in the general population of demographics of Islam and its various formations, you know, this kind of the end is near mentality. But um, if my but personal I, experience is any testament that it is. It is, okay. Yeah. So I, and I think it depends upon what, what, what layer, you know, what depth of the religion or culture you're experiencing, you know, because I think on the surface, there's always going to be this, um, I don't know, you know, the, we kind of want it to be over in a way. Many people are looking for it. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. But I also think that there's something to the cyclicality of life and understanding its cyclicality and being able to say, well, we don't know God's timing. So we just need to live in balance. And this is my whole point about uh, Ahmed Paul Keeler's Mizan theory, and that is that rather than thinking th of things linearly in terms of this infinite progress mythology, um, we can think of things in terms of more of like a concentric view of the world. How can we live in balance with with the world around us, right? And and so, what would culture look like if it wasn't so uh, possessed by this juggernaut of progress? Um, yeah, and then that's to... a really interesting uh, uh, insight, and I'm glad you brought, brought it up because uh, I, I came across the concepts of I'm not sure if you're uh, familiar, but that there was a Islamic philosopher in this area, but before the creation of Pakistan, uh, partly contributed to be attributed to be the founder of Pakistan. His name was Sir Dr. Muhammad Iqbal, and yes. Indian philosophy. Uh, I was just reading his book. Uh, it's called The Reconstruction of Religious Thoughts in Islam. And he emphasizes that if Islam has to evolve in thought, then we need to break away from that linear concept of time where everything is, you know, uh, leading us to a certain fixed amount. And he emphasizes on a much more, not exactly cyclical, but like you mentioned, mystical in nature, time, that it is not uh, necessarily under our comprehension or under our rules of how we understand time. So I think that's interesting. 
Yes, at 100%. And I think that also, you know, having studied pretty in depth the work of Henri Corbin and his you know, illumination on uh, Iranian forms of Islam, you know, Shiism, Ismailism, um, there, and really what Corbin was doing, also, you know, he, he spoke at great length about the work of Ibn Arabi as well. And I think that, well, I'll, I'll reference another um, English Islamic thinker, um, Hassan Spiker. He he is an up and coming uh, scholar of of great, uh, yeah, great. I don't know, great mind. And uh, actually, I met his father once in the south of Spain, and he said, "You know, I, I really think that you should talk to my son because he, <laughs> you guys are thinking about a lot of the similar things." And and he's put out some interesting uh, videos lately. And one thing he says is that um, Ibn Arabi will be the bridge between the West and Islam. Islam will learn to embrace, I'm sorry, the West will learn to embrace Islam through the work of Ibn Arabi because his work was so radically expansive, you know, and it, and it encompassed so many different things. And he wrote so extensively and it was, you know, they call him Sheikh al-Akbar for, for a reason. But I think that people like Iqbal and Ibn Arabi and and the people that Corban wrote about, you know, Corban was emphasizing the importance of the imaginal, you know, the mundus imaginalis, the khayal, um, the barzakh, you know, these these this notion that what the human being is is not this reductionistic materialistic thing. You know, we we have this the the, the arguably the real organ of of perception of of the human person of the human soul is the imaginal faculty. And so many of these things that we we talk about in 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 religious language in terms of the day of judgment or, you know, for example, with Ibn Arabi, he was taught by the uh, Khidr. And and Jesus was the first one to appear to him in one of his first spiritual retreats. So, but where do these things take place? You know, and we would say that, and of course you can go into Heidegger and some of these other more modern thinkers to talk about these notions of, you know, unveiling and hermeneutic, but it's in the imaginal, you know, that this is taking place. And the imaginal is not the same as the imagination. So also what we you know what does it look like to to revivify religious religious thinking or religiosity in the modern world well i think it 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 incorporates this um revival of of a, an understanding of what what the imaginal faculty is of the human being so th this might be a rather daring question but i i want to i want to see what is your view would you ima would you equate this imaginative to the to the, to the perfect theory of forms of Plato is is that is that eternal relief is that the same relief that Plato was talking about where all things are perfect would you think that they are in the same uh, equation well it depends upon the tradition from which we're approaching the question you know and so I I can kind of come up with my own generic um, response I you know if it's and there are in certain forms of of neoplatonically influenced Shiism, for example, you know, you have like ten different levels um, within that that metaphysical realm of of existence. And you know, within all of the sort of Gnostic neoplatonic texts along the way, they explain it. You know, the different the worlds, the different um, you know malakut, and the, these different layers of of the more subtle levels of of experience, and I would say in short, in a way, yes, you know, and like Carl Jung also sort of equated in a way, I, I would say they were kind of parallel, but not and overlapped in some ways, but Carl's, Carl Jung's understanding of the collective unconscious and Plato's uh, realm of where, you know, the, where the forms exist. I think, I think to, a, to a degree, yeah, I think that, that depending upon how you fraction off the, the metaphysical realm of the imaginal plane, you know, you would say that you know the forms descend to, to varying degrees of of resolution through the different layers of that of that realm, and that's where cash happens. That's where unveiling happens. That's where you know we receive um, symbols or or messages in in dreams or you know even in waking states. You know this, and so this is the more 
gnosis, you know, mm-hmm. side of knowledge. It's like this direct unveiling of something, not through deductive, scientific, materialistic means, but through inner vision. And from a more uh, psychological perspective, that might explain why, even though this is a perfect relief, this is the relief that is beyond the unseen. It, I won't even call it the unseen. I would say it's beyond the unseen. But mm-hmm. at the same time, whatever whatever uh, vision that you're having has some resemblance to the world itself in the way that you recognize those symbols. They're not exactly how they are in the material world, but they're not exactly something that you completely unrecognize. So I think that might fit in there where, like you mentioned, that they descend down from the perfect view. And depending on where we intercept them, we see a form of that uh, uh, of that vision. So I think that's, that's one way I, I would like to uh, think it is. Yes, yeah. And, and then you have people like Sofra Vardi, who you taught, you'd had the, the Ishraqi the Ishraqi philosophy, you know, of, of illumination and talked about I mean, really the Surat Anur, uh, Allah Nur of Samawat Wal Ard, you know, this this ayah was kind of the the cornerstone of that that philosophy and seeing all things in terms of light. And um and so, you know, when we get beyond um depictions, you know, or, or images or uh, simulacra of of things in reality that are implicated within the the imaginal world to to help us move through something or convey a message or bestow wisdom or something that i think that there is a level you know where some some philosophers some mystics some people are you know they're blessed with the vision of these sort of pure lights we could say which you can't describe and that's the whole thing about things like enlightenment or illumination or however you want to call it you know it's that there's no language anymore yeah uh, I, I sort of want to because there are many instances that we can discuss in, in this area but i sort of want to address the elephant in the room which the the way i would like to simplify is is that this whole concept of uh, of illumination or a, a, a world of unseen and then our understanding sort of perceiving from that, or even uh, eventually transcending to that world of a perfect unseenness. This notion in one way or another exists in almost all Abrahamic religions, right? And you, and then there's a gap of maybe 600 years, and then there it exists with the same uncanny resemblance in Neoplatonic philosophy of Plotinus. So... How 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 do you see that? Do you see that as simply there was a truth that philosophers or you know they used to call themselves sages if we we're being historically accurate, you know? So if was there a truth that the sages had intercepted and that is the same truth that the prophets that came later on were describing? How, what is your perspective on that? Well, the first thing that comes to mind is Qul huwa la hu ahad, you know. So if 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 we're if we understand, I mean, this is a very Islamic perspective on things, you know, that all things kind of are reconciled under under that under the the banner of Tawheed, right? So God is one, God is one, and that's it. If it's one, you know, and, and this goes back, you know, as you're you're mentioning to to these at least as far as we have. The, the the evidence of in their writings that are a- existent um, to us in these days. Um, I think that of course you know they're all they're all seeing glimpses of the same thing. And what um, what well, there's one particular Platonic philosopher by the name of Pierre Grimes who he's in his probably late nineties now, but he is a true philosopher to to the core and. You know, he talks about the brilliant light of being, and this is what Plato's talking about, is you know, the whole kind of goal of philosophy is to witness the brilliant light of being, the light of the one, and and you know, to say that we can actually experience or witness the one, the good itself, is um or you arguably you could say that's impossible, right? Or you could say that it's I don't know, you know, we we can't say what's impossible for for things beyond our 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 own agency. But to be able to witness or glimpse at least a bit of the light, the brilliant light of being, the light of the one, this, of course, I think it's undoubted. It's it's without a question in my mind. 
but then does that not open the door for sort of a poly version of the truth where it is like Nietzsche talks about in his uh, in his works that there is a truth there is a core of the truth like you said that you know the unity like Ibn Arabi would say al Wujud, you know that that's that's there but everybody from Christianity to Islam to Judaism to Neoplatonic philosophy they have a slightly different you know for all intents and purposes Buddhism and Hinduism also and Zoroastrianism and even philosophy uh, you know uh, no matter how secular like you said they're all having a glimpse of the same reality right well, one example one beautiful example that comes to my mind is that uh, Mulana Rumi you know in the West uh, they, he, he talks about how in his book Masnavi he gives an example of their, how different people perceive the truth according to their capacities and he yes. said, but some people were left into a room and the room was completely dark and there was an elephant in the room and they were told to recognize what the animal is. And some of them grabbed its trunk, some of them got its tail and some of them got the torso. And so whatever part of the truth they were able to intercept, they described it as that. But because it is beyond the capacity of one human being to, you know, sort of uh, manifest the entire elephant, it is not possible for a, for a human to give an accurate description. So as as harmonious does it sound, do you not think it opens the concept of we cannot understand truth as a whole at all and all versions of truth are just fragments of it. And then we obviously get into the paradox of then who knows which, which version of them is truth. And is there a version of them that is called truth at all? Yeah. Um... That, okay, so there are many, many things that come to mind in response to that. Well, I would say, first of all, the quip that I have in response from one of my professors in graduate school was, whoever said it was an elephant <laughs> to begin with, you know, we said, uh, and so that's, you know, that just to turn the whole thing on its head. But then um, I would say that, well, even in the Quran or the Islamic example, you know, you have the Quran itself. The, the the and the Quran itself is not the physical text. You know, it was originally recited, right? Yeah. It, so it is it is it, it is a sound vibration. But then there's this also notion of the Umm al Kitab, mm -hmm. the mother. So there's this sort of talking going back to this notion of the Khayal of the of the imaginal realm, right? There's this celestial Kitab, mm -hmm. and it was you know there's there's the, the Nohe Mehfuz. Yes. So, so it's this, um, it's this notion that, that we, the revelation occurs and to the individual to whom it is revealed. And this is why, for example, you know, whether it's in the, in the Christian context or in the Islamic context, or whatever it's, it's through that individual, you know, that the revelation occurred and that individual received the fullness of, of that revelation, but they can't necessarily convey the fullness of that experience to anybody else because they were the one who was chosen for it. Mm -hmm. And so I think that there are very few people over the course of, of human history that have the time, resources, and willingness to really look for that brilliant light of being, right? To, to go and sit in a cave as so many did. Um, in our past, right? And really devote themselves to that single pointed mind focus, as the Buddha would say, mm -hmm. to understanding, you know, and, and opening oneself up to to the revelation of, of witnessing reality itself. Now, speaking of the word reality, there's a, there's a great book called Reality by uh, an incredible academic scholar by the name of uh, Peter Kingsley. And he talks a lot about the pre-Socratic uh, philosophers, such as Parmenides, Empedocles, et cetera, et cetera. And he basically, and as you mentioned, you know, rather than saying philosopher, we might say sage, because what these individuals really were is they were, they were prophets, healers, sages, all in one. And what they would do, as he outlines in the book, the common practice is that they would go into caves. They would go into something that they called incubation, which was basically they'd lay in the cave in deep meditation for 
days on end and they would come out and they would have some sort of prophetic word or they would heal people. Uh, um, and so we can see that there's definitely a, if we just look at the form of the philosopher or the mystic, we see that whether it's in the early Christian context, the fathers of the desert, or in in the, Islam, the Islamic context with the prophet himself, or um, the mystics, you know, the Sufi mystics, or uh, whatever it is, you know, the, the Jewish himself. examples. I'm sorry? Buddha himself. Buddha himself, of course, of course, of course, the Buddha himself. Um, you know, we see the similar form of how they come to these realizations. And so I think that the, again, it depends upon how, what one's own convictions are, you know, because if we were to talk about it from an Islamic standpoint, we would say, well, yes, all peoples have been given a book. All peoples have been given revelation and there's truth in all that revelation. And it is subsumed, you know, into the, this last revelation. And so if we look into this last revelation and compare it, we really open ourselves up to this, this, the eyes of the heart, really, to see beyond just the literal, literal text. Also, as modern people, we don't, we, we're very literal, you know, we don't know, we don't, it, it's very strange for a Westerner who starts to be interested in Islam and it's, it's all oral, you know, we, we recite everything. It's a completely different relationship to language. So I would, I would say that. It is certainly not an academic discourse the way we, we think of academic discourse. It is, it is mystic in nature, so it's very difficult to put it in a constraint. Exactly. Yeah, and it's it's to be lived. You know, it's it's really truly to be lived. And and I think that one thing that I again I find very beautiful about the Islamic tradition, which is sort of a prophylactic or a um, medicinal quality of it for the modern world, just just culturally speaking, psychologically speaking, is that only up until you know maybe five, six hundred years ago, um, d you know, only at that point did we really start becoming literate in the way that we understand literacy now. Before, you know, in the early Christian church, to to recite something in one's mind was unthinkable. You know, when you recited a text, it was a completely embodied experience. The text was illuminated. It was beautiful. It, there was time invested into its production. And when you recited it, it was an embodied thing with the voice. And and now we're so deep in the, I don't know what you would call it, you know, the, the egoic mind in a way, right? Which is all about proposition and opinion and words on a page and uh, rhetoric in a way. And, and, and we lose that embodied component. Yes, the, the, there's a reason one of my teachers back in the madrasa, he used to call the modern academic system stale and dead quite bluntly. It's like... It's it's not alive, and you know they used to refer to one of the qualities and one of the names of God, which is al Hay, that God is alive, and so they used to say that this knowledge is not alive, it's dead, and if you consume that, your soul becomes dead. So you know there there is a very uh, it's very blunt in nature, but it it, it it is very evident, like you have been mentioning that that there is that discourse with academia, and uh, I I exactly I feel like. The way the modern academia is pursuing knowledge as a whole, it, it is not only uh, distant and you know completely broken away from the tradition. I also feel not only is it not yielding any result, I feel like it is yielding disastrous results. Just think about philosophy and how it has been completely broken away from ethics and morality. And the mm -hmm. result of that is that there is no department of ethics or morality policing, uh, whether it be science or technology or whether it be uh, politics for all we know. So you know, okay. uh, it, it goes all the way back to how Plato used to think that the rulers should be this philosopher king or the scholar king, who should be you know, academically, uh, you know, merit, he should be academically merit. So I, I feel like that should transition us into, and I would like to, you know, have a detailed analysis of yours because I know this is a topic that you've delved into, which is how do we we understand there is this this knowledge? We understand there is this harmony between this knowledge, but then the question remains: How do we transition it to apply to our daily lives? What, what is your, you know, research and finding of that? I want to, uh, you know, have 
illuminate me on that. Yeah. Uh, uh, well, I think the word for that, the good life, right, would be eudaimonia in uh, in the Greek. And in a way, I think that that can be translated as to you know good spiritedness. The word daemon. Now we it is demon in English, right? But originally daemon just meant spirit, you know, and you daemon meant you know, good spirit. And Socrates would would talk about this, and yeah, he would say, "There's a spirit with me, you know, all all the time, and it never tells me necessarily what to do, but it does tell me when not to do something." And I think that one of the things that I, the the terms that I I've kind of, I don't know if I invented it or if I, I heard it along the way or, or what, whatever it is, but I like to say that this is the age of the personal God. And that is, and this is to go back to your question about, you know, the, the postmodern value of subjective, the subjectivity, relativism, right? I think, again, finding balance between the, you know, the megalithic kind of cultures, culture at large and, or traditions of our past, and then the subjective individual embodiment of that, which is always going to be very unique because every individual is unique. There's many pathways to God as there are individuals, you know? So I think that, um, how do we, yeah, how do we employ or uh, philosophical findings, knowledge in, in our daily lives to to have a positive influence upon the culture in general, but upon also our, our own subjective well-being and proper ontological orientation, I think ultimately is what it's all about, is um, I think a lot of it comes down to intuition as well. You know, um, you know individuals such as myself, I can't, I can't claim any, any special knowledge or, or any status or anything whatsoever but I definitely can say that I was born in an environment which did not lend itself to, uh, it didn't inhibit me from intellectual pursuits, but also, you know, I don't come from a family of, of scholars or, or educated people, but from a young age, I just felt this, this impulse to, I had to discover, I had to go out there into the world and learn about about other things, you know, other cultures, about our history, our past, about my own personal roots. And I feel that um, however erratic at times that pursuit has been, it's been worthwhile because it's it's allowed me to make make meaning, you know, to find some semblance of of of, of a, a structure or a foundation that I can within my own self, you know, ontologically that I can stand upon and say, okay, yes, you know. I, I've read enough. I've, ex I've explored enough. I've had an, 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 enough conversations to be able to draw some conclusions, you know, and say, well, everybody's pretty much saying the same thing. So if the vast majority of people, you know, that I that I have come to respect and admire are are consistently saying the same thing across traditions. Then there must be some sort of objective truth to certain pillars of knowledge, you know, about how life is, how life works, and what is meaningful in life. Um, but it was my intuition that, that brought me to those conclusions. And so to tie this into the, the whole notion of the, the good spirit of Socrates and the notion of the imaginal, and that is, and, and also Ibn Arabi, it is that every individual has their own personal Lord. There's the Rabb and the Marbub, the Lord and the one who is lorded over. And so, you know, and then you know, even in the Islamic context, you know, we talk about the many different names of God, as you mentioned, al Hay is one of them. And it's, it's, I think it was Al-Ghazali who, um, who delineated those 99 names originally. Um, but, you know, we could theoretically say that there also is, there are as many names as there are people. And so every individual relates to the one in their own unique way. So there what... Is, uh, sorry, I'm interrupting, but there is actually a, a prophetic tradition, a hadith that very clearly mentions that God is what you perceive him to be. So I think mm. that ties in beautifully with what you are saying. God is uh, God is to his to his subject as the subject perceives him to be. So if he thinks yeah. God is merciful, God will show him mercy. But if he thinks God is wrath, then he will show him wrath. Yes, yes. And also uh man arafa nafsuhu faqad arafa rabbuhu. Like 
um, who knows himself knows his Lord. And so again, it's this, and that's, and that's the reconciliation with, with postmodern and, 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 and the person who would, you know, be a, a really vehement, um, proponent of, of, you know, subjective knowledge and everything. And to, and to a degree that we have to make room for that. And that's the only way that the traditions are really going to, uh, you know, if there's going to be another golden age, I don't like to say that that, that was the golden age. That that's the one of the myths about Islamic history that I think needs to be working is that that wasn't the golden age; that was the first age. Yeah. And so, if there's going to be a return to this more cosmopolitan, um, I like to use well, we could say baraka, but I think there's this beautiful word that I mentioned to you earlier, which is veritas. Veritas is a word that was used by this. Uh, one of the doctors of the Catholic Church, this saint, Hildegard of Bingen, and she said the veriditas, it, it means this greening power of the presence of the Holy Spirit, uh, and that, you know, to invite that energy back into our culture at large, it requires that we that we be open to, to a diversity of expressions. And so... Um, you know, this from a philosophical perspective, that would be that would be my response: is how do we invite ourselves and one another to open ourselves up to to the to the voice of God, which is the our personal Lord or or the angel presenting itself to us in that very unique way, which requires to go back to those ancient sages in the in the caves. It requires that sometimes we just sit in stillness in khalwa, khalwa, yeah. Khalwa, exactly. So, so that would be my response. Yeah, Khalwa, a fine time. But I really want to implore on that point. You know, that 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 has been stuck with me the most about how you mentioned the hadith. Uh, even though, for, for all intents and purposes, uh, there that, that is a weak tradition in the Islamic tradition. So there is some skepticism yeah. about its uh, about its authenticity, about its uh, credibility. But regardless, it is a very you know, a, a widely quoted citation and yes. similar quotations are available throughout the scripture. But I really want to implore on that because uh, the, personally also when I want to make sense of that in that greater uh, concept of, uh, of, of knowledge, uh, I have to, two parts and Islamic scholars have debated, uh, similarly philosophical scholars have also debated on one of these two parts, which is either all human beings, as well as because there's one God and God created all human beings. So there is that unity that Ibn Arabi talks about, you know, and everything, it's pretty clear, right? But then scholars like Dr. Iqbal comes along and he says, is this not evident that every single human being is unique? And, you know, we, we, we discuss fragments of both of this, where we talk about how God is up to your perception. And everybody has a different perception of God, like you mentioned, a personal God, right? So... It, it, how how do we reconcile both of them? There's the concept of a universal central God, which is you know the surface level concept, even in Islamic and all religious traditions, that there is one God, everything is from its essence, of, you know, there's unity of being. But then there is that God is up to your perception, and then you know there's, there's this, as many perceptions of God as many people, and so there's a little bit of unique and personal God. So how do you see them both being reconciled? Oh, I think that that is the philosophical question, you know, the question of the one and the many. That that's simply what it all comes down to. How do you reconcile the one and the many? And I think that to fall back on uh, on my research and personal history with Christianity, I think that um, a trinitarian ontology is the solution to that problem. And you find uh, sort of Trinitarian ontologies within certain um, strands, strains of Islamic philosophy. Um, there's one really great scholar who I love to listen to by the name of Dr. Khalil Andani, who he graduated with his PhD from Harvard, I believe, and he specializes, specializes in uh, Neoplatonism and certain forms of Ismaili Shiism and, and these uh, more Eastern expressions of Islamic tradition. And he does quite a bit of um, explaining on on the similarities and differences between you know, the kind of neoplatonically themed uh, ontologies within Christianity and Islam and how they compare and contrast. Um, but I think that 
one way to make sense of this from my own my own synthesis is that you have the one which is beyond all things. This is in Latin, Deus absconditus, the hidden God, the God which is the luminous darkness, which is unintelligible. And then you have its active force, the word, okay? Kilmatullah or the logos. Ibn Arabi talks about this quite, quite a bit as well. And this whole concept of the logos is something which maybe we can talk about another time, which is a whole, that was my original question when I was young was, what is the logos? You know, like, what do you mean that it was only Jesus? You know, it couldn't have just, it couldn't just be Jesus, you know, like if, if, it, 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 and there are ways to, you know, you find reconciliations within the, the Eastern Christian tradition, you know, the, the logos spermaticois, which is the logos, which is spread throughout the universe, like, like shards of a fire, you know, or seeds. But, um, you know, out of the, this Deus absconditus, the one, comes the, the the primary intellect, right? Which is, I mean, this is all like Plotinus as well. So you have the first intellect. And then out of the first intellect, the first intellect contemplating the one overflows into the world soul. And then it's out of the world soul that everything else comes into existence. And so I think that if we... It reminds me of, that reminds me of another prophetic tradition. Again, disclaimer, it's weak. <laughs> But uh, it, because of how similar the wordings are, I couldn't help but wonder upon that. The prophet said in one of the attributed traditions, he said that, so there was this God. Somebody asked him about the creation of the universe, and he said there, there was God. And inside the God, which was created. But there was God, and then from his essence was created the prophet. And then from the essence of the prophet was created the rest of the universe. So, you know, it, it's similar to what you have been mentioning that and Ghazali talks about this in rather quite detail, perhaps as a response to Neoplatonic philosophy being prevalent in the Islamic era. But so we understand that we have to somehow separate God as you know something beyond the first cause. He is not the yeah. first cause, he's the causer of the first cause. So we yeah. separate it from that and we say, okay, the rest is anything that is uh, achievable or talkable. But you know, does that mean that there will remain a fragment of truth that is inachievable? Uh, is it because of, we just don't have the capacity to achieve that? We don't have the capacity to achieve the what? The, the, the causer of the first cause, because, you know, we, we can only right. go till the first cause, and beyond that, all logic and science fails. Well, and I think that that's, that's the fine line between a purely philosophical approach, let's say, in, in one sense, like like a, a, a rational philosophical approach in which we say, well, it's all it's all incumbent. And this is the difference, like, for example, between like Theravada Buddhism and um, and revealed religions is that, you know, the characterization of, of Theravada Buddhism is that it, you know, the Buddha, it's, it says many times in the sutras, you know, the Buddha, the rightly self-awakened one, right? So it's only by his effort and his effort alone over the course of many lifetimes, right, that he achieved final liberation. Um, and you know, this the the fine print on that is 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 arguable. You know, how you really define that and if you can reconcile it with with I think I think that there are many reconcilable points with with revealed religions. But the difference is that what's emphasized in in Abrahamic traditions in the Quran is that you know God is all knowing ultimately you know <laughs> so it's it's always gives deference to the one and it's like look we will do our best you know we do our best but at the end of the day we ultimately can never truly know the one itself right we can you also reminds me of uh, the, the theological interpretations of Ahad and Samad. So they, you know, they, they say Ahad is okay, we understand. It is numerically one. But Samad is unique in a very unique way. It is unique in a way that is, you know, neither achievable nor explainable. I think yeah. it's that, that not only is he Ahad, but he's also beyond that. He's Samad. And yeah. the, you know, like you're saying, that maybe we... If that is what you're saying, that maybe we cannot achieve it at all. I th yeah, and I think that that's and ultimately that's that's the beauty of 
a faith-based or religious um, orientation towards life is that one gives space for mystery. And, and that's so, you know, for example, within the Christian tradition, that's w where that's really emphasized is in the Eastern church. And the Eastern church is clearly the more, uh, the one that has maintained kind of this more mystical and neoplatonic, um, vein within its, within its body. And yeah, so, so I would say that we have to ultimately, and, and that's the prophylactic also against this modern, uh, worldview of uh, this reductionistic materialistic worldview of you know everything can be boiled down to its its you know mechanical parts basically and you know how can we take advantage as to, to the nth degree of of nature you know and and not really you know there's no room for mystery it's like no we will find it out we just need time you know so just give us time and we're going to find we're going to find the soul or we're going to find the mind where we know how it's generated we know what chemicals are involved and um, that really just kills life, you know. That, there's... It, that was the stubbornness of empirical science, you know, when they when they had this divergence from philosophy. That when philosophy and science sort of broke up, that was the insistence that science had that if it can be proven empirically, it can exist. Otherwise, it does not exist for all I care. So you know, right. that, that ties in what to what you were saying. But I yep. also want to emphasize on. Um, I also want to emphasize on the fact that you mentioned that the Eastern churches are still much more intact with the spiritual aspects of, uh, of Christian tradition. Why do you think uh, that is so? Um, well, I mean, I, I'm not a historian and I'm not an expert in any way, but what my, you know, my common sense or from the little that I know, I would say probably because they weren't at the epicenter of the, the current the developments that led to the world as we're currently experiencing it you know I, that more so of course you know it was it was a it was an amalgamation of many different different discoveries and things happening and people convening in different spaces um you know even even the sort of what led up to cartesian dualism a lot of that was what the the groundwork for that was being laid in Western Europe. Mm -hmm. uh, is, this also, is this uh, strictly in reference to the Enlightenment or even before that? Even before, yeah. You know, I mean, it's. Uh, I think a lot of it started with Ibn Rushd, Averroes, yeah. um, in Andalusia and Al Andalus, and you know the things that were happening with certain. Um, sorry, one moment. Um, with certain, uh, you know, translations of. Of certain texts and the way that things were getting interpreted, and um, you know, there's a, there's a whole there's people that have written books about this um, and talk about it at great length. So so I won't even try. Um, but yeah, you know, when when we started developing technologically and the printing press became a thing, and 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 it allowed for the dissemination of those those certain perspectives and the uh, the severing really of of rationality from the the interior life you know it, all of a sudden rationality got co-opted and directed only towards the exterior aspects of of our ex existence whereas you know before rationality could you know function in this hermetic way of moving back and forth between external um investigation and and internal investigation and so we kind of lost access to a great degree to that, to that internal life with those those developments and so I think, you know, in in the East, they were sheltered in some ways from from a lot of those developments because they weren't at the epicenter of it. I think also um, just simply the, the 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 nature of the schism between the Eastern and Western church and how subtle things changed, or subtle or not so subtle things changed in the Western, Western church, you know, dogmatically, mm -hmm. um, structurally. Also the history that they were built upon. You know that that the Roman versus the Greek, you know the Byzantine, and then and then the fact also that that the Eastern Church was always in much closer dialogue with its neighbors, um, so Islamic and otherwise. So you know because the reason I mentioned that is because it has always fascinated me, but also confused me how the Eastern tradition, uh, both 
in the eastern Asian, you know, Middle Eastern and also Central Asia, the Christian, whether it be the Christian tradition, whether it be the Hindu tradition, whether it be the more Eastern Islamic tradition, they have always had this sort of unity about spirituality being at the epicenter of it. And like we discussed that the Western tradition sort of broke off with it. But what really fascinates me is that from a purely geographical perspective, we understand that the the initiation of philosophy happened somewhere as what, what we would understand today as the West, the Greeks, right? And it, it, it just never made sense to me how, uh, as as the time went on in Western philosophy, they picked up pace. The Western world benefited from it. And so did the Eastern world. We could we just discussed how the Islamic tradition benefited so much from the same source of Greek philosophy. So what I'm trying to come at is that it's it's a little bit confusing for me from a historical perspective how the source of both the Eastern and Western tradition was Greek philosophy. But Western philosophy ended up being, you know, completely uh, empirical in nature and cut off the spiritual aspect of it. But the Eastern tradition had held on to it. And you have mentioned some of the historical instances of that. But there's one more uh, I want to add on. And uh, I was recently came across it uh, in one of the lectures of Dr. Roy Casagranda. I'm not sure if you're aware of his work. Yes, I know. Yes, I know yeah, he's done some incredible work on that. And that was what we mentioned in the beginning about the harmony of the Eastern and Western tradition. And he mentioned that history has been taught in a very biased way. Philosophy is not a solely Western tradition, even what we understand as Western philosophy. And, you know, all kudos to Russell's for uh, writing a brief history of Western philosophy, and he made it, uh, you know, scholars before and after him. They made it be presented in a way that, okay, Greek was West, and then all philosophy to come after that was also West. But if you think about right. it, the Greeks also had a very, you know, two-way collaboration with Mesopotamia, with Egypt, right? So they, they took works from them and they, uh, you know, very actively collaborated with the Egyptians. And they had an yes. equally equally uh, enlightened worldview, equally enlightened philosophy. So I feel yeah. like this was, uh, I had a rather recent unfortunate interaction with one of the academic scholars of philosophy. And they insisted that philosophy in itself is solely a whisper invention and that baffled me i was like because that that discredits all the works that have been done all the way from india to indus valley to mesopotamia to egypt before the greeks so you know somewhere i think that this was attributed to that western biased view of how you wanted the history to be and you wanted to be the champion of uh, of modern intellect but i just feel yeah. like it, it, it didn't work out in either way what do you think about that yeah that's well i think you know in, in order to counter just in the way that we speak you know i think it really comes down to language and we have to become more con conscious users of language and again plato talks about this in a number of his texts um i think again in the phaedrus and the cratylus is where you would find a lot of this but he goes into etymology and and hermeneutics right and uh, we hermeneutics really is to take something back to its to, to unveil it right take something back to its origin that wheel and um and etymology is similarly right just purely linguistically and i think that this and again coming back to this question of you know objective knowledge versus subjective knowledge and relativism and that is that philosophy as we commonly conventionally use the term in the modern era does refer conventionally to continental philosophy, right? Or, you know, this Western philosophical project. And it doesn't, it doesn't align with the etymological meaning of the word itself. So I think that what the true philosopher in all senses is trying to do is to engage in this completely holistic hermeneutic alchemical activity of going back to the source, the anagoge, you know, the, the recital of one's soul to, to glimpse this brilliant light of being, you know, to go out of the cave and then to come back down and free the fellow uh, prisoners in, in the allegory of the cave, you know, of course. 
So what we must do is go back to the sources, right? Go back to the source of our language even, right? So we say philosophia, right? The love of wisdom. And there's, another, there's another translation of that. It's escaping me right now, but it was really interesting when I read it. But, you know, we'll, we'll say philosophia just means the love of wisdom. So you say, okay, well, yes, I'm a lover of wisdom. Well, then you can say, you know, symptomatically, well, where do I see other lovers of wisdom in other cultures? Well, maybe they call, they call themselves fakirs or murshid or yogi or, you know, whatever. Like, they're using different language because their their root is a little bit different uh, culturally, historically, linguistically, but but symptomatically, you know, they're, they're doing the same thing. And then I think also, you know, it's so easy to paint things and this is where this, the value of the academic comes in is that they can, they really hone in on one thing. So, you know, there are scholars that talk about just, you know, ancient Egyptian um, medicine, you know, or, or plant usage. And of course, the ancient Greeks would go down to Egypt to get their wisdom and study with the priests there. That was a, very common. And they would go would go to the East as well. And there's a lot of uh, suspicion or, or even evidence that, that some of the the theories of of Plato, Parmenides, and Pedocles, these guys, you know, they came from a Zoroastrian milieu, or there was at least conversation between the two communities, and 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 we also just to talk about Ibn Arabi, who was not so ancient, you know, twelfth, thirteenth century, um, but we seem to think that like the, the ancient world was so siloed and isolated, you know, no, these people traveled very extensively. And Ibn Arabi himself, you know, he spent the first portion of his life in the south of Spain. Even then, he was traveling between North Africa and Spain extensively. But then he finally takes off, goes through the north of Africa, goes to Mecca, goes up to uh, to into Syria, what is now Syria, and you know that's where where he ended his life. But I mean, you know, for, just for a modern person, that's a uh, a huge swath of territory to to cover. And so, you know, th these guys were men and women were they were in conversation with each other. And there was a lot going on, and, and it's easy for us to just, um, you know, label things and compartmentalize them to make it easier for us to make claims and, and you know, push forward our opinions on things. But in reality, our, our history is much more subtle and, and intertwined than, than we perceive on the surface level. Yes, but, you know, I agree completely, and which is why I think it is important to sort of have a much more updated definition of philosophy because even now philosophy is understood uh, regardless of the root word it is understood as let's just say abstract knowledge and not you know everyday used knowledge and one of my favorite uh, instances of disproving that this notion is just just blatantly wrong is because the word scientist was not used up till i think the 14th century there was no word as scientist. They used to call themselves natural philosophers or philosophers of the science, you know. And th that does not discredit when we talk about people before 15th century, so somebody like, you know, Archimedes. We, we agree that he was a scientist, even though the word did not exist, even though the term did not exist. But in retrospect, we understand that, okay, that area of philosophy, the natural sciences, is now understood as science. So I think in similar way, we I, I like to define philosophy as a holistic process of intellectual inquiry. And that intellectual inquiry could be anything from science to abstract nature to theology. And, you know, uh, th there is there's really no limit. So I personally think that we need to, you know, sort of redefine philosophy as that. And it will not only allow us to rightfully credit the past philosophers before the creation, but also help us moving forward, have a much more holistic academia of philosophy that does not constrain itself with a tradition or with the historical constraints, but it is open, it is talking to science, it is talking to, you know, all sorts of fields. So I, I think we are in much need of that in terms of an academic uh, renaissance. Well, and I think that it's happening, you know, it, it definitely is happening. And there are people like, for example, John Verveke, I don't know, have you heard of John Verveke? No, I'm not familiar. Um, he is a cognitive scientist out of the University of Toronto, and he is doing really incredible stuff with, um, he has a, tr a past in Zen Buddhism, but um, also Greek philosophy. And he has um, a few series now on, on YouTube, which are available for free, which are, are incredible. I mean, that is your 
college education right there. If you want to understand the course of Western history and philosophy is um, uh, Awakening from the Meaning Crisis, I believe is what it's titled. And it's like 50 something videos. And he just systematically goes through and, and in a very comprehensive manner explains how we got to where we are now. And his whole uh, mission, I guess you could say, is how how can Neoplatonism serve as like the courtyard in which we can have these interreligious dialogues and dialogues between uh, science, different forms of, of modern sciences and religion. And, and he's doing great uh, great work in that regard. There are also people like, um, I studied with Charles Stain for I said, the, the uh, Henri Corban course. I, I studied with Charles Stain at uh, Harvard Divinity School. And he is the head of, um, oh gosh, what is there? I th- it, it, the World Religions... I forget exactly what, what what it's called the program, but but he's also doing some really incredible stuff and talk and and just you know the intersection of things. So there are people even within the academia that that are doing this kind of work. And um, granted, you know, they're they, and not everybody can be doing it, right? Everybody's doing their own thing, but they are doing this work. And so I, it's it's hopeful because when you start again, you know, my whole my whole. I'm on my soapbox, you know, talking about the intuition, right? If you follow your intuition, which is that, you know, the, the light of the intellect, which is, you know, guiding you, it's like your flashlight and you're shining it here and there and, and, and you don't really know where you're going. So you don't have the full map, but you know, you follow the crumbs along the way, you follow the, the signs. And, um, and, you know, again, the, the signs that this is a thing this, religiously, you know, look for the ayat, you know, the signs in your life. And and you come and you find people, you know, of your tribe, and you find people that are doing similar things, and and then that's the beauty of it. And the, the beauty of finding people in on the opposite side of the planet that are that are passionate about the same things, and and collectively we can, you know, what what can be born through of us in that endeavor. And I think that's what's exciting right now. You you know that that's beautiful. I'm so glad you mentioned it. Uh, firstly, yes, on second thought. Uh, and I will obviously look further into it, but there are academics who are actually, like we talked about Dr. Roy Casagrada, and he explained yeah. it very clear in every one of his historical lectures that this is not a Western-centric view. This was much more nuanced than that. And I think there are, I came across the, the like, because I recently wrote an article about this whole thing because I just felt like it was a great injustice to in the definition of philosophy. And I came across some work from the Department of Philosophy at Cambridge, and there's a professor by the name of Dr. Leah Cantor, and she wrote her entire uh, thesis about this. And she gave reference of ancient Chinese philosophers, that they were way before Greek philosophers. And we understand that their work was philosophical in nature. And one of my favorite references is the Epic of Gilgamesh from the Sumerians. It is like the oldest scroll you can find, and this filled with uh, what we understand today as you know philosophical works. So I'm really glad you brought that up. And on your second point, I completely uh, love that. It reminds me of a authentic this time, an authentic prophetic tradition. The prophet talked about how an arwah min al junu, the soul is like you know, it's yeah. like groups of people. So yeah. this, <laughs> exactly, and you know that uh, you you were groups and you were members and you know each other in the past world, and you know that's that's where the concept of soulmate comes from. But then, you know, you come to this world and you have to find your soulmate in that more platonic sense that yeah. your people, like you, you use the phrase your tribe, and I love that, you know. Yeah. Like, when you, like you mentioned that the way I found you and, you know, we had this lovely interaction. So I think that that is the way forward. And that is the little bit of pieces that we all can do from our side and eventually hope for a more harmonious and much more, uh, you know, Correct and accurate historical philosophical perspective. So you know that was lovely, and you know thank you so much for that. And I think we already have taken so much time for you. I would love for you to uh, give me maybe a summary or an outro of your concepts that you think are th- that would define you or that would be the central hypothesis of your life. What would that be? Oh wow! 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 Uh, well, uh, let's say at this point in my life, I would say that um, there is incredible value in our traditions and great wealth that that can be tapped 
when we when we open ourselves to them uh, and that might take a lot of work uh, to be able to rid oneself you know or get get the cobwebs away of 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 what this as you mentioned earlier kind of this dead form of knowledge that the modern world uh loads upon us right to be able to remove that and and look with fresh eyes upon our past and see what richness lies therein and then to be able to um to interpret that and embody that in a modern context and and that there is a um a certain level of courage that's that's necessary a certain kind of chivalry even uh to be able to stand in what one believes in you know what, what one's convictions are um in the face of of certain cultural societal trends and and say you know this is i know that this is good you know and i and i and i am fighting for you know i'm i'm a witness for the good the true and the beautiful and so you know, in doing that, you know, and and I think that one of the greatest tools for that is to follow follow the signs, you know, that God puts into our hearts, to follow the intuition, the voice of the angel, you know, or of the of your personal Lord as 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 it is revealed to you. And uh, when you trust in that, and you you see guidance in it, and you like you mentioned chalwa, you know, which is you know retreat or seclusion, or you you make time to let your soul speak to you in a way. And to let those those messages come through, then then things start to make sense. And um, so I would say that um, yeah, we, we all just need to make sure that we find space in the midst of the of the the chaos of of all the information and consumption and things that we have access to, which is a great blessing. But at the same time, find find the balance, right? Find the the mizan, you know, the balance scales in this time. That is lovely. I love. How you mentioned because most philosophers want to take the easy road and talk about uh, subjectivity, and then you know because that elevates the burden of fighting for what you believe in. But I, I love that you mentioned that because uh, if we don't fight for what we believe in intellectual grounds, I think with all apologies, do that Socrates died for nothing. You know that that whole concept, that whole story sends shivers down my spine. You know Plato is there, he's telling him. But there is an escape plan, and he says that no, this is what I stand for, and you know. The, so I think yes, that that is the true spirit of philosophical or intellectual inquiry. So thank you so much, Joshua. Uh, I hope uh, it was as fruitful for you as it was for me. I got to learn a lot, and uh, looking forward to more uh, amazing content from you. And I hope uh, the audience and the viewers and the listeners also uh, enjoyed it. With that, thank you so much. And I, I hope to see you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Salman. Beautiful conversation. Thank you. Thank you.